And uh, as I said, Ned is live streaming to us from uh, York uh, this morning. Hopefully that will all go smoothly. Thanks and for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, obviously, I wish very much that I was with you in person. Let's get that out of the way first. Uh, I came to Australia to do some marketing workshops a few years ago, and it was one of the, just the most fantastic things I've ever done in my entire career. And uh, don't tell Sydney and Brisbane, but Melbourne was, was my favorite. Um, but here I am in my, in my kitchen. Uh, it's quarter past midnight. Um, I do have Jim, uh, which is exciting. I've never done a presentation with Jim before. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Um, I've actually got the live Q&A thing open on another screen. So I would totally encourage you to basically interrupt digitally at any point. I would love to have questions as we go along, but also just comments. If you've got stuff you want to share, if you you know things that you've tried out and you want to tell your, your peers about, I would just say like, go for it with the, with the live Q&A app thing and I'll pick stuff up as we go along. Um, so, I work with a, a lot of libraries uh, and they talked about how exciting social media became when the pandemic first hit, right? There was this kind of period where obviously, first of all, we adjusted to the extraordinary change of the pandemic. And then everybody started to interact online more and social media, which was always quite a, quite a good thing for libraries, became an exciting place to be because we were developing relationships with our users. And then, maybe in the last six months or so, a lot of libraries have said that that's kind of dropped off a little bit. Like they don't quite feel the same level of connection with the audience that they did when we were really like in the first year or so of COVID. And some uh, libraries have basically said, like, how do we feel re-energized about this stuff? How do we refresh? our approach to social media. And I was trying to think about the fact that uh, you could, you, the audience that I'm looking at now, could be from uh, maybe five or six different sectors of librarianship. Right? There's, it's not that everyone's from public libraries or everyone's from academic libraries or health libraries or special libraries. So what, what's universally true about social media that would apply to all of us? Like what are the things that, that matter to all of us? Because it's not as simple as saying like, Instagram is really important because it might be, but it might not be. It depends on where you're working, what you're doing. So what I've come up with is a library social media manifesto, which I hope is applicable to all the different sectors of, of librarianship, and that I hope will kind of provide like a way of re-energizing and refreshing uh, people's approach to social media and their, and their kind of good feeling towards it and all the connections that we made with our audiences. So that's what we're talking about today. And as I say, Hit me with questions and comments uh, throughout if you have any uh, that you would like to ask or say. So I think that there is um, plenty of problems around social media in a kind of global sense. I don't think we're going to look back particularly fondly on the stuff that the social media companies are doing at the moment uh, when, we, when we recall this period of history. However, if we're going to be selfish about it and just think of it from a library point of view, it is a pretty great gift. Um, the, the, there was a, a, a thing about 10 years ago where everyone talked about social media as being, it was great because you could go to where your users were. And I, I think some people got a bit bored of that, like it became a bit kind of a, a hack thing to say. But I still think it's true, I still think it's important. But the fact that we can have a conversation with people where we uh, reach them in the spaces that they're in, without them having to come into our buildings to talk to us. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. We can inform them, we can keep them up to date with things, we can entertain, we can distract them. And we can also break down barriers because we all know there is still a kind of hangover from the idea that libraries are, are, are very serious and austere. And I genuinely think if you can make your users feel good about the way you're interacting with them online, they will come into your building feeling better. They, they will come into your building more confident about coming and asking for help and, and thinking of the library as, as nice and, and approachable. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty great thing for us. It's worth making the most of. And the numbers just keep going up and up. Like the last thing you'd want is um, to invest loads of time in something which didn't have legs, right? So I don't know about you, 
I don't have like marketing in my job title. I've got a load of other stuff I have to do apart from the marketing related stuff I do for my library. Um, and if I'm going to fit this in, I don't want to be spending hours on something which might have just disappear. So I feel like we can be encouraged by the numbers. I think this graph is interesting though. This is the only time I've ever seen a, a social media graph where there is a, a dip at any point. So according to this data from Statista, in, in 2020, you as a country went down 1% in your social media use, and, but then you leapt back up in 2021. So it is, generally speaking, going up and up and up. So we can feel confident that we're not wasting our time. All that said, I think it's actually very easy just to do social media without ever thinking about what we're trying to achieve. Like it, I'm not talking about for ourselves, I'm not talking about individual, like my own Twitter account, I'm talking about for our organisation. Um, we, we can just get out there and do social media without ever having the time or the space to, to take a step back and say, what are we actually trying to achieve by being on social media at all? And how does this, like, are we achieving those goals? Are we, are we, are we doing the thing we set out to do? So the first, uh, I don't know what you'd say, tenant in, in my my manifesto is we will have purpose like we will work out what it is we're trying to do and then we'll do that rather than just reacting and existing on social media without necessarily knowing exactly what we're there for so i think a lot of the time it is common that library social media presences are sort of built upside down we join a platform because we think we should be there and then we find the use for that platform um, and so it's an interesting, particularly those of us that work in academic libraries, <laughs> there's an interesting pattern where basically we will realize a social media platform is good, join it, and then slightly ruin it for the people there because we're not as cool as they are. So uh, we kind of chase them across the social media landscape from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram and then to, to TikTok. Um, it would be better if things happened the other way around where there was a sort of a need that came up and then the social media fulfilled it, like joining the platform fulfilled the user need. And it's not too late to turn this upside down and do this. We just need a bit of time. We just need a bit of space. We just need to think like, what is the need and how, how do we use this platform to fulfill it? So I'm hoping uh, that everything is working and you're seeing my screen. I, I can see, can you just wave at me if, you're, if you can see my share? Okay, thank you so much waving people. I very much appreciate that. So on the screen here, We've got a bunch of potential reasons, right, where, where this is why we are there as a, as a library on social media. And I've left two uh, cells of this table at the bottom blank because there's bound to be lots of reasons that you can think of that I've not put down on the screen. This is not an, ex an exhaustive list, right? This is just things that came to my, my mind. Um, and I think focus can really help with your social media. So one of the useful things to do is to pick maybe four or five things and make that the main priority. Now that's not to say you're not gonna do any of the rest of the stuff. It just means these are the things you're gonna concentrate on, right? So it might be that keeping up, users up to date, that's just a really big part of what we're doing, but also so is making the library a bit more approachable. We're trying to make sure that people realize we're quite nice and quite fun. Um, promoting specific services, that might be a goal for the social media. Uh, getting some dialogue going, answering some questions, but also maybe giving the users some, some tips and some tricks and some kind of hacks. Maybe those, maybe those are the five priorities. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're five completely different ones for every single person in this room. Um, the point being, pick a set of things which support your organisational aims, right? And then use social media to do them, and you'll start to feel... It working better because you've got focus. Like it feels like if we can be all things to all people, that should be great. But actually, it doesn't necessarily work that way. If we're too diffuse, um, then people don't know us for anything, and then, then it becomes harder to to uh, make our social media work. So basically, having a uh, uh, um, uh, a purpose, like wipe the slate clean and think, right, what what are we trying to do here as a library, and maybe. When you think of it afresh, it'll be the exact things you were doing before. That's, that's absolutely fine. It's about having that conversation um, internally with, it, with anyone who you think might be useful to have it with. What are we here for? What are we trying to do? And are we actually doing that? Um, and I think the users benefit from that as well as us, because um, when you get a bit of momentum, when you get a bit of uh, a sense of that's what this library does in this space, then that tends to uh, 
work well. It tends to be rewarding for the user. The second thing in the manifesto is we will coordinate. So when we're kind of trying to get a, a key message out into the world, um, when we post it over multiple channels, then more people see it. And of course that's good because we want to reach as many of our users as possible. So if we post something on Twitter, we also post it on Instagram, and we have it on our digital screens in our library, then we've got a decent chance of a lot of people seeing it. What is really useful though is when people see it more than once. And that's why it's worth coordinating the social media and also coordinating the social media with the not social media. So the, the more traditional marketing channels we have available to us, if they can talk the same language at the same time as the social media, that's really, really good. Because if I see a message from you, the library, even if I'm interested in it, I might not act on it first time I see it. I, I like it. I, I'm just, I'm super busy. I'm stressed out. Life is, 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 a, there's a lot going on. Even if I think, oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. I quite like the idea of that. I'm still not going onto a computer, logging into something and signing up for something or, or visiting the building. I'm just thinking, oh yeah, I should do that, but I'm not, I haven't taken that next step. When I see the piece of marketing a second time in another context, that might be the time when I actually do something I wasn't going to do before. And that's, that's really, really important. What we're not trying to do is, is just duplicate across all the different platforms. So, you know, if I'm looking at your Facebook page and your Twitter page, I don't necessarily want to see the exact same thing as a user on both. But I want the key messages there, but we might tailor them, we might adapt them for the, for the different platforms. So what we're trying to do is, is not this kind of like every single uh, egg is the same. They feel all of a piece, but they are tailored, you know, right? There's a sense of like, this is for this, whereas that is for that. And then your audience feel like you're speaking to them. It feels personal, it feels more of a, of a connection. Lots of our uh, communities are on different social media platforms. How do we know which ones? How do we know which people are on which platforms and how to reach them? Now, this is not an easy question with a definitive answer. One of the ways we can do that is literally just asking. I mean, I'm not normally a fan of surveys, but a really basic, simple survey, three, three question survey can be really effective. And you could do one about social media, like how, okay, question one, how do you find out about library changes? Like what is your method? of getting news about the library. Question two, which of these social media platforms are you on? Question three, which of these social media platforms would you like to hear from the library on? That, that would be useful. Doing some UX where you actually talk to users and say, how do you find out about stuff? We did that recently at my library. And basically what we learned was every single undergraduate only really gets news from Instagram. And so as a result of that, we've stepped up how we use Instagram. And it's, it's, it's been useful as a result. That won't be the case for everybody. If you're in a health library, for example, maybe Instagram is not going to be useful at all, but speaking to your users will tell you that. What you can do is you can look at demographic data. So this is a, a, a slightly hard to take in graph, right? which, I'll, which I'll, I'll take you through the kind of bit that I want to show you of. So this is, this is the question, which social network do you use most often? So it's not, it's not the people that are only using one or the other of these, it's the one that they turn to the most. So you can see that it's the percentage along the bottom, it's the age ranges, the age ranges down the left hand side. So there is a, a, a skewing towards Instagram in the, in the youngest age group there. And um, also you, uh, TikTok is extremely popular in the 16 to 24 and then super diminishing returns instantly that you, you leave 24. Like you turn 25 and suddenly you have no idea how to do memes and dancing and lip sync. Um, Twitter is really consistent. If you look at Twitter down the right hand side, it looks small, but 5% doesn't seem very much. That doesn't mean only 5% of people use Twitter, it's just only 5% of them use it most often. But it's five for the first bracket, six for the second, eight for the third, four, six for the fourth. It is strangely popular amongst all the age ranges there. So you can be kind of confident if you're using Twitter, that you're reaching quite a wide variety of people. You can be kind of confident if you're using uh, Instagram or TikTok that you're reaching a younger demographic and you can be kind of confident if you're using Facebook that you're reaching an older demographic. Now this is not a bulletproof way of social media strategizing, right? But it is helpful. It is helpful to think we've got slightly different people re being reached by these channels, right? So generally speaking, and this is broad brush strokes, um, YouTube is pretty universal. Okay, so if you if you're if you're if you can make a video which helps your users understand something, then they will probably find it if it's on YouTube. You can embed it on the website or wherever. 
and they can find it there too. But the fact is, everybody is on YouTube. Facebook is still the most popular social media uh, network, but lots of young people are, are, are going. If you're in an academic library, it's increasingly irrelevant or decreasingly relevant, whichever way you want to put it. Um, whereas in public libraries, I think it's still really, really important. Twitter, it's got that even spread. It's particularly good for 35 to 44 year olds. So I've got two years left of it being relevant for me. It's, it's really good for interaction. I, I, so Twitter has problems, but it is great for dialogue with users. It's kind of hard to beat for having a conversation that involves a lot of people. And then there is Instagram. I think Instagram is the most interesting one for libraries at the moment. It's growing all the time. It is genuinely worth putting time into, but it is more complicated than the others. So you kind of have to plan with several different content types. Generally speaking, if you've got an Instagram account as a library, if you can post to the grid three or four times a week and then post to your stories a bit more regularly, you will find that you're getting messages out to users that way. So it's worth having. And then there is TikTok. And as we saw in that graph, it's extremely skewed towards the younger audience. I think it's pretty hard to do TikTok well without appearing on camera. And I don't want to do that. I, I do not want to be the person who is uh, in shots on my library social media, and nor do I want to ask anybody else to do it either. So I don't have TikTok for my library. Um, we, we've got the name just so no one else can steal it, but I'm not using it. Um, I think I need a really good use case to, to split my time even further. Because one of the things that's really useful about social media is not spreading yourself too thin. If you do want some inspiration, two libraries is a really good account to have a look at. So strategize. We've only got so much time. How do we use it? What platform needs more of your time? Um, what is your strategic priority? Like, if what are the demographics that you really want to engage, and can you use the platform more that engages with that? And it might be that your biggest audience is older, but you're already doing really well with them. So maybe you want to use another platform that skews younger because then you can make the most actual gains happen. Um, it might be that you know, your Facebook or your Twitter has been going for such a long time, it's really, really fine. It's fine. So maybe we can invest a higher percentage of our time in Instagram instead. Now, everyone is different. I'm not saying stop doing one and just do the other, but we can, we can tweak things and, and make the most strategic impact with the social media. And you can also say, Going back to our list of my, our top five aims, maybe like Twitter's good for these ones, Facebook is good for that one, and also along with Twitter, it's good for that. Instagram's more about those, YouTube's more for this. You can start to think about, you know, this is what coordination is. It's thinking, what do we achieve with these platforms? And then how do we go about achieving it? Incidentally, if you're, uh, Yes, that's a great question, uh, Amy. So do you use social media in tandem with older forms of communication like email? Absolutely, yes, and even posters, but it's hard. So you have to have the left arm know what the right arm is doing. And there is a lot of lead-in time with like a big email that's going out to a huge group of users or especially like posters that literally have to be printed. Sometimes you have to hold back the social media to coincide with the, with the traditional media so that it goes out at the same time. But it is worth it because then people see that maybe a second or a third time they get that, that significant, oh yeah, I was going to do that, now I actually will do it. If you're looking at the social media and you're looking at the channels that you're on, and one of them stands out as, I'm not sure this is actually doing any of those names, I, I don't think it's doing anything, then do not be afraid to kill social media accounts. This is the nicest picture of killing I could find in this uh, So it's okay to get rid of stuff. We've only got so much time. We're busy people. Um, just, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but just the emotional energy that it frees up to get rid of the social media account for your library will make the other social media better. So if it's not working for you, if it's no longer playing a role that your users are finding useful, just ditch it. Just, just, just don't be afraid to ditch it. I don't know if you've noticed, but behind each of my manifesto points, there's a Melbourne-related picture, or just a picture of Melbourne. Um, this is the one that works best as a visual metaphor, I think. Showing personality. This, this piece of art in the background, there will be some people who go, you know, they just kind of would dismiss it or say, I don't like that, or why, why have they done that, right? And that is a risk of having some personality, is that someone will say, oh, I don't like that. But the fact is, this piece of art will make a connection with a lot of other people. And it, it is okay to not please everybody. I don't want to insult anyone, but I don't necessarily want to please everyone. And showing personality is really, really important in social media. 
Um, is there a, an app where I can post up to multiple social media platforms at once? It, so there is, Vincent. You can use stuff like uh, Hootsuite, for example, um, where it can post to more than one channel. However, I wouldn't do that because the, the platforms are different. They have their different rules of engagement, different things that suit them. So duplicating content across them uh, is, is not necessarily uh, always something that your users are going to actually appreciate. So if, it, if possible, I wouldn't just auto post across the platform. So personality, consistency is overrated. We all think we should be consistent. We don't necessarily need to be. Uh, what I'm trying to say really is that more than one personality in your social media is better than no personality at all, right? So if, if you post on a Monday and Tuesday and your colleague posts on a Thursday and they are different to you, that is okay. It's better that than smoothing all the rough edges away and leaving just a generic no personality tone in, in its place. Um, Liz says, is it worth using LinkedIn? That is very sector dependent, I would say. Essentially, the smaller your audience, the more LinkedIn is likely to help. So if you're in a you know, medical practice, if you're in a, a business like pharma, if you're in a, a law practice, you could potentially connect to every single member of your audience on LinkedIn, and then you get useful updates from them. If you're in a public or academic library, the audience is too big, and I wouldn't worry about LinkedIn. Personally, that's just my take on it. So putting personality is, means giving a little of yourself and taking a bit of a risk, and it means being creative, and be creative is such a, such a trite phrase. What I mean by it, that is, if you've got a choice between, should I do this thing that we do all the time, or should I do this thing which I think might be quite good, but I don't know if everybody else will think it's good, just, just try that one, just try it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question from Tony. How do you gradually introduce personality? I would say, literally, as you say, just introduce it gradually, just occasional tweets where you're thinking, I'm gonna use my own voice for this, and that's fine. I, I'll, I can still say we, rather than I, but I'm gonna put my own personality into this tweet, and I'm gonna see how it goes, because this, thank you, Tony, because it leads me to my next slide. Social media disappears so fast. Like a terrible mistake will be there forever, right? Don't get me wrong. If you say something really bad, people are gonna know about it. But if you just try something and it falls a bit flat, there's just a million tweets in the next three minutes that will just bury it. it like, it goes by so fast. Taking a small risk on social media is not like hanging upside down over a path where if you get it wrong, there's really serious consequences. If you just take it, like, I'm gonna try something a little bit silly and see how my audience reacts. And if they like it, you'll know. And if they don't, it just passes, it's fine. So I think it's worth taking a bit of risk, putting some personality in. There's no like ideal level of formality because it changes across the sectors. But I really, really do want all of our social media just to be friendly above all else. So the way that I approach it in my context is we still spell things right, we still capitalize stuff. Um, that's how we retain our credibility. But the way we talk, the voice is very, very informal, very personal, um, and basically exactly like I would try and address someone face to face. Um, so that's the, the balance that I think works well. Here's a little unscientific study of popular social media posts from library. Sometimes it's just about taking the chance for levity when it falls into your lap. So this was a tweet from my colleague, Alice. Someone handed in a bra at the help desk. Now she could have just tweeted, somebody's handed in a bra but she really went for it with the puns, and it went down really well. And for a while, this was like the most popular tweet we'd ever sent. Um, this, uh, if you're not familiar with Orkney Library, um, they are a tiny, tiny library in Scotland who have the best library Twitter account of all time. Um, and this was the culmination of an extremely long and torturous thread, which was all building up to a pun based on a song, and people lost their minds. They absolutely loved it. This is the Bodleian Libraries in Oxford, which I, I really like this, it's not a beautiful day, spend all of it indoors, in the libraries, in the, in the dark. Sometimes it's about sass. This is possibly the most popular library tweet of all time. Uh, it just, I mean, you can see what it says. It doesn't say, please do not use cheese as a bookmark. It just says that, and it's really good. University of Liverpool are very good at this. They have form for this. Please don't shelve sandwiches. If you need help differentiating between books and food, ask a member of the staff, hashtag experts. Sometimes whimsy goes down really well. When we had a load of robins seeking warmth in our libraries because we couldn't close the sodding windows because of COVID, uh, we, we, the, the students took a load of photos of robins just like studying over their shoulders. And they loved it when we, when we put them all together into a thread. Uh, this is a public library. I think this is just four books returned in the order that they returned them in there. But it reads like some kind of Nordic poetry from the 12th century. 
uh, I, would, I would read the rest of that volume. Um, <laughs> this, I normally shy away from the shushing trope that Cardiff really knocked out the park with this when, when lockdown started. If you need a personalized shush, please reply here. Um, so sometimes whimsy can work really well. This is a University of Florida library. They had a, a dog with a GoPro that just went around the library being petted by people. And it is just, and it, it occasionally it says like, oh, person and stuff on the screen, and people will love that a lot. Now, these are all fairly kind of viral. Virality is not the aim. I would never sit down and go, oh, I must write a viral tweet. It's just about engaging your community. And when you use either sincerity or humor or sass or whimsy or just making the most of stuff when it happens, that's when um, people talk about it to their peers. And sometimes they talk about it to lots of their peers, and that's great. But that's not the aim. We just want to engage. Number four out of five, we will empathize. Um, we want to put ourselves in our audience's shoes. So some useful questions to ask, so what? Would I act on this if this was the only information I had? Like if I wasn't a librarian, you knew why this was useful. Would this persuade me to change my behavior to do something I wasn't going to do before? That is a hard question to ask yourself. So empathetic libraries that put themselves in the shoes of the audience, they use calls to action. So don't just say this is good, but tell people what to do next. Reserve your place is better than find out more, right? Tell them something exciting. Frame messages in terms of the benefits. We so often talk about the features without talking about the benefits. Find a job that makes you happy is better than we have resources for job seekers. Because finding the job is the benefit. Resources are the feature. Focus on feelings rather than function if you can. So that new book feeling is, a, is, a, is an emotional connection that we have, whereas search our catalog to find thousands of books is not. Don't duplicate the messages. Adapt your messages across the different social media platforms. So, you know, use Instagram stories for news and pictures of words, but don't put that on the grid because it doesn't work for the grid. Just use arresting images on the grid. And fundamentally, empathetic libraries learn from their users. Like, you do not have to be an expert in analytics to learn stuff from what your community likes. They will show you what they like. The key is to do more of what they like. So, I've got two minutes left. I'm going to say my last thing, which is we will analyze. We will, we will learn from our users. And, and you do not need to compare yourself to other libraries, by the way. It doesn't matter how much engagement that another library's got on social media or any other kind of account. What matters is, how does this compare with the rest of your social media? How does it compare with the other ways that you communicate? If you're improving, if you're getting more engagement, then that's great. And you know, 10 people liking a tweet, is better than five people liking a tweet. It doesn't matter if the library down the road has 100. It's about the fact that you're increasing your engagement. So don't let analytics overwhelm you. Honestly, like the built-in analytics on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you can spend 10 minutes and you can learn stuff that you can make changes as a result of. So just hovering over your posts on Instagram, just looking at the posts that went well and went badly is enough to learn what your audience likes and to do more of the same. So, in summary, we will have purpose, we will coordinate, we will show some personality, we will empathize with our audience, and we will analyze what goes well and do more of it, and what goes not so well and do less of that. And I genuinely think I spend a lot of time doing this social media stuff. If we do this, we're going to feel energized, we're going to feel like we've got it going on, and our audience is going to respond positively to it as well. So that's my take on it. Um, thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for your questions as well. And I will hand back to Alan now. But yeah, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Ned. I, I don't know if he can hear us, but uh, I'm sure he knows that we're very appreciative. So <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. So we have